In the 1800s, in the industrial heart of America, railroad bosses struck gold, not with shining coal, but with what everyone else called trash. Culm, the leftover dust from Pennsylvania's mines, became their prize. Saving millions demanded a machine that could turn that worthless fuel into unstoppable power, no matter the risk to human life. Crews called it the Widowmaker, a locomotive engineered for profit, notorious for isolating men in noise and heat, and for killing without warning when brittle rods shattered beneath the cab. Why did the railroads gamble with lives just to burn garbage, and how did that decision change America's engines forever? Calm piles rose like black mountains across Pennsylvania's coal country. This was not the shiny, hard anthracite that heated city homes or powered the finest locomotives. Calm was what got left behind. The dust, the shards, the broken bits too small for the market. It sifted through the screens at the breakers and collected in heaps, sometimes taller than a row house, darkening the landscape with waste nobody wanted. Pick up a handful and it would slip through your fingers, gritty and fine, a mix of coal fragments and stone. The texture was closer to sand than to rock. It was damp, heavy, and cold even in summer, and it stained everything it touched. But the real problem was not just the mess. Calm was stubborn. Unlike good coal, it did not catch fire easily. It was low in volatile chemicals, the part of coal that flashes and pops when a match hits. Instead, calm burned slow and cool, needing more air and a much bigger fire to stay lit. Ordinary locomotive fireboxes built for lump coal would choke and sputter if you tried to shovel in this stuff. The flames would die down and the train would stall, the fireman sweating and cursing as he tried to coax heat out of what was basically dirt. The chemistry of Colm made it a headache for anyone who needed reliable power. Anthracite, the parent coal, was prized for its clean, hot burn. But Colm had lost most of that punch. It contained more ash, more impurities, and less of the oils and gases that made fire leap. To keep a locomotive running on Colm, you could not just throw in more fuel. The firebox needed to be wide, much wider than normal, so the thin layer of fine coal could spread out and smolder, drawing in enough air to burn at all. Think of it like baking bread. A thick loaf stays raw in the middle, but a flat bread cooks through. Colm was only useful if you gave it room to breathe. By the 1880s, these mountains of waste had become a symbol of lost profit and frustration. Railroads like the Reading watched their own engines roll past free fuel every day, forced to buy expensive lump coal while Colm sat unused by the ton. The temptation was obvious. If someone could figure out how to harness this stubborn, gritty trash, the savings would be enormous. But first, they had to solve the riddle of how to make a locomotive eat what every other machine rejected. Railroad accountants did not see mountains of Colm as a nuisance, they saw a gold mine with the wrong label. The ledgers from the Reading told the story in black and white. Every ton of lump anthracite that went into a locomotive cost the company real money. In the 1870s and 1880s, good coal fetched two, sometimes three dollars a ton at the mine. By the time it reached the railroad's own engines, the price could climb even higher. Multiply that by the thousands of tons burned every week to keep trains moving, and the fuel bill became a constant headache. Calm, on the other hand, barely counted as a commodity. It was the waste left behind, so cheap that mine owners sometimes paid to have it hauled away. For the Reading, which owned both the rails and the mines, the only real expense was paying men to shovel it off the piles and into rail cars. The difference was staggering, dollars per ton for lump coal, pennies per ton for C-U-L-M. Even after accounting for the cost of loading and moving it, Kulum undercut the price of good coal by a factor of five, sometimes ten. That kind of gap made the men in the boardroom sit up and pay attention. Every trainload that burned Kulum instead of lump coal meant more money left in the company's pocket. Over a year, the savings ran into hundreds of thousands of dollars, enough to cover payroll, expand the lines, or pay out dividends. In an era when the reading was hauling millions of tons of freight and coal each year, the fuel bill was the single largest operating expense after wages. 
The pressure to cut costs was not just a matter of thrift, it was the difference between profit and bankruptcy in a cutthroat industry. The Northeast's steel mills, foundries, and factories all depended on steady, cheap shipments of coal. If the Reading could deliver on that promise by burning what everyone else threw away, it could underprice the competition and lock in lucrative contracts. The lure of free fuel was so strong that it overshadowed almost every other concern. Safety, comfort, tradition were luxuries for the men in the cab, not for the men counting the receipts. The company's books did not record the sweat and risk of the crews, only the savings per mile. That is why the search for a way to burn calm was not just a technical puzzle. It was a business imperative, and it would take a new kind of thinking to cash in on the mountains of waste piling up by the tracks. John Wooten understood the railroad's headache better than most. Born and raised in the heart of Pennsylvania coal country, he started in the shops as a teenager and worked his way up to master mechanic for the Philadelphia and Reading Railroad. He was not a boardroom man. Wooten spent his days among the engines, sleeves rolled, face streaked with soot, listening to the hiss of steam and the grumble of frustrated firemen. The problem of calm, anthracite waste was personal to him. Every day he watched mountains of wasted coal pile up outside the shops while the company paid dearly for the good stuff. Wooten's mind worked in practical terms. If Colm refused to burn in a regular firebox, then the firebox had to change. He experimented with shapes and drafts, sketching ideas on scraps of paper and shop ledgers. By 1876, he filed for a patent on what would become the Wooten Firebox, a design that was nothing short of radical for its day. Instead of the narrow, deep chambers found on most engines, his firebox sprawled out wide and shallow, almost twice the width of anything else on the rails. The patent described a great surface big enough to spread the fine coal thin, letting air flow gently through the bed. It was a mechanic's solution to a chemist's problem. Reading shop memos from 1877 show Wooten pushing his crews to build and test the new design. He was not after glory, he wanted results. Every successful trial meant more coal burned and less money wasted. The shop floor buzzed with talk of the big box engine. For Wooten, the real victory was seeing mountains of trash coal vanish into the fire, replaced by steady steam and a quiet ledger. His invention would soon force the entire railroad to rethink not just how engines burned fuel, but what it meant to put a man in charge of such a beast. The secret to burning calm, anthracite waste, was not brute force, it was geometry. Standard locomotive fireboxes were tall and narrow. They worked for lump coal because thick chunks could pile up and still let air pass. Calm was different. Its grains were fine and dense, and if you heaped it deep, the fire would suffocate. Wooten realized the only way to keep a calm fire alive was to give it space, a grate so wide that the coal could be spread in a thin, even blanket. Air would rise gently through the whole bed, coaxing the stubborn fuel to smolder instead of choke. On paper, the numbers looked almost absurd. A typical firebox of the era might offer 30 or 40 square feet of great area. Wooten's design doubled that, sometimes reaching 70 or even 100 square feet. The fire sat low and broad, never more than a few inches deep. This was not a roaring furnace, it was more like a giant bakery oven, with the heat spread wide and shallow. The thin layer of calm burned slow and steady, drawing just enough oxygen to keep the steam up mile after mile. The payoff was immediate. Engines fitted with the wide firebox could burn anthracite waste that had been piling up for decades, turning what was once a useless byproduct into a steady source of power. Railroad records from the late 1870s show a sharp drop in fuel costs wherever the new fireboxes went into service. The Reading, Lehigh Valley, and Central of New Jersey all rushed to order engines built around this principle. But there was a catch. The firebox was now so wide it spilled out past the driving wheels. That single fact forced a radical rethink of the entire locomotive's shape. The Wooten firebox solved the fuel problem, but it created a new kind of headache for the men who built locomotives. 
A standard engine's firebox sat neatly between the frames, just wide enough to fit behind the big driving wheels. But the Wooten box was a brute, nearly twice as wide as the boiler itself, stretching out past the wheels on both sides. There was no way to squeeze a cab behind it. The firebox did not just fill the space between the frames, it swallowed it whole, pushing up against the very limits of the locomotive's wheelbase. The floorboards and walls of a normal cab would have to float in mid-air, hanging off the back with nothing to support them. That was not just awkward, it was impossible given the pounding force of the rails and the constant vibration of the engine at speed. So the only option left was to move the cab forward, perching it astride the boiler like a saddle on a horse. The engineer's new home was a cramped box balanced directly over the spinning rods and roaring steam, suspended above the machinery that made the whole design possible. It was a compromise born from geometry, not comfort, and it set the stage for a working environment unlike anything else on the rails. The engineer sat alone in his glass box, 20 feet ahead of the fireman, with nothing but steel, steam, and the endless clatter of wheels for company. The only way to speak was to shout, but the roar of the fire and the pounding of the rods swallowed every word. Diaries from Reading Crews describe how a man could spend hours without seeing another soul, eyes fixed on the track, one hand on the throttle, sweat pouring down in the summer heat. The fireman, perched on a narrow deck behind the wide firebox, worked in isolation. He shoveled calm, anthracite waste into the furnace by feel, trusting the engineer to keep the pace steady and hoping no signal would be missed in the noise. If trouble hit, whether a fainting spell, a slip on the slick deck, or a heart attack, there was no warning and no way to call for help. The distance between them was more than just feet of machinery. It was a silent void, broken only by the shriek of the whistle or the hiss of escaping steam. In that emptiness, every mile felt longer, every risk sharper, and every sound from the engine below was a reminder of how alone a man could be at the front of the line. Steel rods, each weighing hundreds of pounds, spun just inches beneath the engineer's boots. At speed, they blurred into a silver arc, cycling up to 300 revolutions per minute. In the world of the Camelback, that was not just noise, it was a loaded gun pointed straight at the cab. 19th century metallurgy had its limits. Rods forged from high carbon steel carried hidden floors, tiny cracks, sulfur pockets, the ghosts of a rushed pour at the foundry. Every mile, every jolt, every hard pull up a grade added stress. Sooner or later, something gave. The worst failures came without warning. In February 1896, a Reading Camelback thundered near Tamaqua at 55 miles an hour. The side rod, under full load, snapped at the crank pin. Freed from its track, the broken rod whipped upward with the force of a guillotine, slicing through the floorboards of the cab. The engineer, Thomas Kelly, never had a chance. An eyewitness, his fireman, later told a union investigator, it come up through the floorboards like lightning from hell. The cab filled with steam and blood. Kelly bled out before the train rolled to a stop, while the fireman, stranded at the rear, kept shoveling, unaware that the man up front was already gone. Camelback cabs, perched high and centered, offered no escape. On a traditional locomotive, a broken rod might bounce harmlessly into the dirt. Here, the engineer sat directly in the line of fire. Maintenance logs from the Reading show cab floors patched again and again, cold reminders of near misses and fatal strikes. Crews called them widowmakers for a reason. Each run was a gamble, every mile a reminder that profit came at a terrible price. By the early 20th century, the outcry from the men who ran these engines could no longer be ignored. Meetings of the Brotherhood of Locomotive Engineers grew heated as stories of shattered cabs and lost limbs filled the minutes. Union leaders drafted petitions, stacking them thick with signatures, demanding an end to what they called murder for men. The pressure built, not just from the shop floors, but from accident reports and the testimony of widows left behind. The Interstate Commerce Commission, armed with the authority of the Boiler Inspection Act, called hearings in Washington. The transcripts read like a ledger of suffering. 
Engineers described the terror of sitting above spinning rods, and firemen recounted the silence that followed a missed signal or a sudden jolt. Safety inspectors laid out the numbers, dozens dead, hundreds injured, all in the name of burning cheap fuel. Railroad executives, clutching spreadsheets and profit statements, argued that the engines were essential and that the men knew the risks and took them willingly. But the tide had turned. In 1918, the Interstate Commerce Commission issued a circular barring new camelback locomotives from inspection, making it nearly impossible to put another into service on interstate rails. The order was reinforced in 1924 and written into law in 1927. No new cabs astride the boiler, no more engineers riding above the very machinery that could kill them. Existing engines were allowed to run out their days, but the era of the Widowmaker was officially over. The verdict was clear. Profit had driven the invention, but in the end, the cost in human lives was too high for even the accountants to ignore. Industries still chase profit by pushing the limits of human endurance and safety. The Camelback's legacy endures whenever cheap solutions overshadow the people who operate them. Today, Workplace fatalities in the United States number more than 5,000 each year, a reminder that the trade-off between efficiency and human life never truly disappears. Progress always asks, whose risk is acceptable and at what price? Share your thoughts below.